Our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 12 and verses 32 through 40. Listen to God's word as he speaks to us today. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there is your heart as also. Be dressed for action. Have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that they may may be open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly I tell you that he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them, finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Samantha tried to take a sneak peek at the sermon this morning, had to slap her hand, and now I broke the music stand. And so she sabotaged that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, you know, when I, when I preach, I like to start off with something a little funny to help us get us engaged. And so there's a guy who sees a sign in front of a house. It says, Talking Dog for Sale. And he rings the bell. The owner tells him the dog's in the backyard. The guy goes into the backyard, sees the black nut just sitting there. And he looks down and says, you talk? Yup, the mutt says. So what's your story, mutt? Looks up and says, well, I discovered that my gift of talking pretty young. And I wanted to help the government. So I told the CIA about my gift. And in no time they were jetting me from country to country. And sitting in rooms with spies and the world leaders. Because no one figured that a dog would be eavesdropping. I was one of their most valuable spies. Spies. Eight years running. But that jetting around really kind of got to me. And tired me out. And so I knew I wasn't getting younger. So I just wanted to settle down. So I signed up for a job at the airport to do some undercover security work, mostly wandering around near suspicious characters and listening in. I uncovered some of the incredible dealings that was awarded a batch of medals for my work. Had a wife, a mess of puppies. Now I'm just retired. And the guy was just so amazed that this dog was talking to him. He goes back in the house and asks the owner what he wants for the dog. And the owner says, ten dollars. And the guy says, this dog's amazing. Why on earth would you be selling him so cheap? The owner replies, because the dog's a big liar. He didn't do any of that stuff. You can't believe a word he says. (laughs) Pray for me while I pray for us. Father God, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, Lord, be pleasing unto you this morning. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, according to U.S. history... The attack of Pearl Harbor took place on December 7, 1941, on a sunny, sunny morning. A minimal contingent of soldiers was on duty at the time. Most offices were closed on base. Many servicemen were on leave for the weekend. Even new technology, including the new radar mounted on Opana Point, were in place, manned and functioning at the time of the attack. The incoming Japanese attack planes were detected by that radar, reported, but were mistaken for an incoming group of American planes due from the mainland that morning. Now, while on practice maneuvers outside the harbor that morning, an American destroyer spotted a Japanese submarine attempting to sneak into the harbor. Submarine was fired upon, immediately reported, yet ignored. 
Now, despite these and many other warnings, Pearl Harbor faced the greatest great loss that day, and so did the American people. The losses and ill preparedness came from one major cause. No one believed it could happen. Now, this morning's scripture addresses the issue of preparedness. Now, if you were here last Sunday or you watched the Scott sermon, last Sunday's scripture, also right before this one, dealt with another kind of preparedness. But it really wasn't a spiritual preparedness. It was more of a stagnation preparedness. I want to go back to that scripture real quick that we read last week. Because I think it will put this week's scripture into context. In Luke 12, verses 16 to 21, he says, And he told him this parable, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said said to him, you fool, that very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Now we can see in the scripture that Pastor Scott preached on last week, he was preparing, but he was preparing for the wrong reason and the wrong purpose in a spiritual sense. This week's scripture kind of puts that all into to, to formation here. He says, do not be afraid, you little flock, for the Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He's, he's pleased for that. Sell your possessions, give them to the poor, provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moths destroy. For where your treasure is, but your heart will be also. It says, be be dressed, ready for service. And this is the important part here, I think. Be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning. In other words, be ready. Be prepared for that day. Like servants waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that he comes and knocks and can be immediately, the door can be opened for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. This scripture talks about Jesus' return. It talks about the fact not of storing things up for ourselves, but storing up ourselves for him. That's the question we need to be thinking about today. Are we prepared individually and as a member of the body of Christ for that day? Are we prepared? Let's first talk about this individually. How prepared are you? How many have taken a trip this summer? Raise your hand. You've taken a trip. Lots of preparation, right? You've got to make sure you pack all the right stuff in the suitcase. You've got to make sure your itinerary is set to go. You've got to make sure you've got a place to stay. All that stuff has to be taken care of. And then you get on there, maybe you're boarding an airplane, and you think, oh, did I leave the iron on? In our house, that doesn't matter. We use the dryer. (laughs) Did I turn the stove off? Oh, no. Those little things tend to haunt us as we get ready to leave. Oh, did I lock the door? They get the best of us sometimes. Did we pack enough? Did I forget anything? Jesus is telling us in this parable to be ready. He, we do not know the time or the date that he plans on coming back. But he says we should 
be prepared. We should be prepared. So, how do we prepare, you ask? Well, to prepare for Christ's return doesn't take a lot of planning. It does not take a lot of planning. But it does take a couple of things. It takes diligence and dedication. Diligence and dedication is what it takes. So if I was going to pack a bag for Christ's return, what would it have in it? What would my bag pack for God's return have in it? Probably nothing. Because I won't need it. Won't need it at all. But the bag I carry today needs to hold the things that prepare me for that day. So what kind of things are you talking about, Steve? I just so happens I brought my bag. That's heavy. So what do I have in this bag? Hmm. Got my Bible. That one doesn't work. I got it in electronic form. That doesn't work. I've got it on my phone. I won't use it to make phone calls, but I can sure use it to, to read the Bible. So there's several things that I need. Oh, wait. I found more. Oh, if I got to read the Bible. Everybody remember this? It was in the bulletin several weeks ago. Prayer to the Holy Spirit and the prayer, the, you know, prayer, two prayers to the Holy Spirit. I use that. Got my version of the upper room. You got yours? I get mine on email too. You know, I, those are just several things that I have. Now, it's good to have those things. But if I don't open it up, it can't help me. I have to have it open. And I have to read it. And read what he has to say to me. See, I've got to have that thing. I carry something also to take notes in. I got my, my book. I use this to take my notes. It's got a few notes in from the scripture from today and preparing for the sermon. Also has some of my school notes in it that I've been doing. Has my prayer notes in it too. You see, that's the third thing. But I can't put that in the bag. And that's my prayers. Prayer is an essential thing that we need to have to prepare ourselves for that journey for his second coming. And why? Because that's the way we build our relationship with Christ. By reading the Bible and turning everything over to him through prayer. And you think, you know, that's all good and dandy, but, you know, I just don't have time. Yeah, I used to think that too. But then I also realized that the more time I spend with him, the better my life is right now. It's not perfect. And it's not without trouble. But it's better than it is without those things. Now, it's not for everybody, but I get up at 5.30, in, about 5 in the morning. I fix my wife's copy, get, her, get it ready for her when she gets up, and then I spend some time in the morning, just he and I. Now, your schedule can be totally different. But let me tell you, make it a priority. Make it a priority to spend time with him. I don't care if it's in the car going to work, to and from, but we've got to make time for the priority 
to prepare for his coming. You see, I've got a couple other things. Oh, wait. I've got to make sure my heart's right. My heart's not right. Nothing's right. My heart's got to be right for him. Something else in here. And what I show other people also matters. I kind of like this one. Those are some of the things that I do, folks. I can't tell you how to do this with you. You have to find out for yourself. You have to find out for yourself. You see, because we are in a spiritual warfare right now. We are in that day. Sometimes we call it a bad day. We blame it on mean people. But many times we're under heavy assault from, you know, the devil. And these tools we have in our go bag. They're essential. It's essential. What's the old saying? It says the Satan gets a little scared when we carry a Bible. He gets even more scared when we open it up. There's truth to that. Because he knows we're looking at the right place. And that's not his place. The devil gets scared when we open the Bible. We develop that relationship with Christ and know who he is and what he is for us. Are you ready for his return? Well, there was this young woman who was expecting a date. She was dressed up. She was waiting for him patiently. However, by the time he was an hour late, she got discouraged. She figured she'd get stood up. So she goes up, takes off her makeup, puts on her pajamas, gathered all the junk food in the house, sat down and watched TV with the dog. I don't know if he talked or not, but he was with the dog. Her favorite show was just coming on, then the doorbell rang. And it was her date. He says, I'm two hours late and you're still not ready? I can only imagine what she said. But she was prepared, but she decided that it wasn't going to happen, so she put her lamp out. She extinguished the flame. But we are his people, and we're called to keep our lamps lit, ready for his return. So that's individually. What about we as a church? Are we ready? Are we ready as a church for His coming? Most of the things we have in our go bag collectively work as a church. You see, we're called as Christians to be in fellowship with each other. You and me, us, together, one body. What does that mean? What does that really mean? We're called to be welcoming to others. We're called to be welcoming as others, as like guests at a banquet. Are we prepared for that today? If somebody new walked in those back doors, are we prepared for that today? I like to think we are. See, I remember back when I came to this church. Now, some of you probably don't remember that. But I sat right over in this section right over here. And I didn't tell anybody who I was. There were two ladies sitting behind me. And they were making sure that I had my hymnal open and was able to follow along the service. And they were doing what good folks do. What we do. 
and they helped me as much as they could. I finally had to turn around and tell them that I was a former pastor at the time, and I knew what Methodism, Methodism was. <laughs> but they were insistent, and I appreciated that. That's called being welcoming. I also remember probably several people came up and talked to me, but there were two that stood out to me. And there was one person, Daryl Johnson, was not going to let me leave here until he had to say with me. Now, it was good, Daryl. Daryl and I, we, we talked about this, and it was great. He really made me feel welcome here. The other was Jack Parrish. He made sure that I was taken care of. When I walked in the doors in the back and I said, where's a place where I can sit where I won't sit where somebody else sits? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And he said, well, you can go sit up there. Sometimes the praise band sits up there, but they'll move. <laughs> but again... A lot of people spoke to me when I was coming in that day. Jay spoke to me. Unfortunately, he knew who I was. <laughs> but there was a lot of folks who welcomed me. It was those two that stood out, but I'm sure there were others. My head was kind of in a fog that day. And that was because I wanted to know what kind of church I was coming to. And that was two, three years ago in April. And I'm still here. So he must have passed the test, huh? You see, we as a church need to be prepared for his second coming as well. You see, here's the thing. We need to not only be doing that here when people walk in, but we need to do it out there. We need to be doing it out there. We have opportunities every day. And you're saying, I don't have any opportunities. I'm retired. I stay home all the time. You do have opportunities. You have a telephone. We've got several opportunities coming up. And I better not get that list for the Grady County Fair back with blanks on it. That's an opportunity to share and show people what we're made of. And we're made of great things, folks. We've got a lot of the... Where's that at? we got a lot of this. we got a lot of this. And we can't keep it to ourselves. We've got to share it. We've got the fair. We've got movies in the park coming up. We have a lot of people who show up for movies in the park. The soup kitchen, another perfect opportunity to share and show our love for others. And don't forget your everyday conversations with your friends, your family. Those you meet on the street, those are perfect times to pull out of your go bag and use them. Don't let the opportunity pass you by. We can't afford that these days. There's too much hurt out there in the world. We can't afford not to do this. It was the anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Union. When this gentleman got a call from Moscow, some of the Russian oil companies had abandoned their wells. They left their rigs with the brakes on. Kelly subs still rotating. Rigs were blowing out everywhere. The oil fields were in utter turmoil. And he was needed in, this person was needed in western Siberia hastily made the necessary arrangements to be on his way. 
answering the call. It would take more than one flight to get him there, the last of which was a very small propeller plane. The engines were so loud, the attendant was passing out earplugs. Everyone around him was speaking Russian, which he barely understood, and with 35 degree below temperatures outside, the plane was cold. But nothing mattered except getting to the job site and taking care of the job. It was a chaotic situation. With thoughts of that running through his mind, he settled in for the four-hour flight on the noisy small plane. The plane was just 60 miles from the airport. The cabin began to fill with blue-gray smoke. Evidently, one of the engines had stopped working. Some kind of electrical short. Everyone started talking at once, their voices quickly elevated, and panic struck. The pilot was trying to turn the plane around, head back to the airport. He felt panic rising within him. Suddenly, the other engine stopped working as well. The plane began to descend. In less than a minute, it went into a free fall. Facing the end of his life, he thought about his children, how the news of the death and a plane crash would affect their young lives. He thought of his mother. He thought about all the things that he had done in his life and all the things he had not done in his life. It was one of those surreal moments that you are just falling. Everything moved in slow motion. Everyone in the plane was screaming. The plane began to descend towards the earth. He felt the horror rise up in his soul. And people were thrown from one side of the plane to the other. Everything was out of control. Out of control. The plane jerked from one side, then the other. No one could tell what was going on, and they knew only that they were going down. In the end, the pilot was able to land the plane with only a broken wing and no loss of life. Now, after the landing, the shocked man, he wanted to make sure all his limbs were intact. He checked everything over. He thought about when the plane was falling, how he thought, had thoughts of his children and the greatest love of his life. He had thoughts that he was a good dad before the, green, before the plane crash. And now he knew he was going to become one. As soon as he was able to get to a town and get to a telephone, he called his mother, thanked her for bringing him into the world. He'd given him a second, he had been given a second chance, and he was going to make the most of it from that moment forward. These days, he smiles more, laughs more, gets involved in activities, brings joy to him and learning to others. He feels like he's living on borrowed time. He says he feels he wants to share all he can every day. He wants to live life longer and live life better. He says work's important. But really not all that important anymore. He spends time with his children, takes them on trips, teaches them about life. He determined after the crash the most important job was to be a good father and the best he could be. He no longer has a fear of death. He met it face to face. But no longer does he take a single hour for granted. Priorities become pretty obvious when you're faced with dying. What you thought important doesn't seem to matter at once, matter anymore. We can't afford to take this day and our coming days for granted. God's calling us for the mission. And that mission is to share our heart and our loves with Christ and with others. We might think that we're busy, but in the grand scheme of things, we're really not. This is our opportunity. Today is our second chance at living life for Him. I've got my go bag. How about you?
Let's pray. Father, we know that you're coming. We know you're coming, and we need to be prepared, Lord. Father, help us to stay prepared, to keep our lamps lit, to keep that hope alive in us. That day we'll see you face to face. Lord, help us to live each day. Lord, not just for ourselves, but for you. Let others see you through us when they see nothing at all, but they can see you. Father, we love you. And most of all, we know that you love us. Let us not take that for granted. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.